My name is Brian Coley. I'm the radiologist in chief at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today I'll be talking about scrotal ultrasound in the child. So first of all, regarding why we image the pediatric scrotum, generally all indications fall into these three main areas, the undescended testis, acute scrotal pain, or a scrotal mass. Regarding undescended testes, approximately 96% of testes are descended at birth and 99% are descended by one year. And in looking at large adult series, there's a prevalence of only 0.28% in adult patients. Most of the time in children, an empty scrotum is really due to a retractile testis, um, although there is a fairly decent percentage of undescended testes. Only about 4% of testes are truly absent. And the reason this is important is that undescended testes can lead to infertility through abnormal tubular maturation, and there's a fairly significant risk of neoplasia. 10% of all testicular cancers arise in undescended testes, and these risks, it's important to remember, persist after treatment, as well as uh, these children may present with testicular torsion of these non-descended testes. So in the evaluation, 80% are usual uh, usually palpable, and most of these are in the inguinal canal as it descends from the abdomen uh, into, the, uh, into the scrotum. So in these cases, very few are actually referred by urology because they can perform a good physical exam. When we do get asked to look at them, it usually is in uh, you know, obese children or people who are not as comfortable with a physical exam. And ultrasound is great uh, when they are referred to finding these testes within the canal and pelvis they're typically a little more hypochoic, uh, they're a little more ovoid, and they're smaller than the usual testis. Beyond the inguinal canal, uh, it gets a little sketchy as to whether we should really be doing imaging. A lot of people have advocated MRI or multi-detector CT, but really with the advent of laparoscopy, most urologists if the, are going straight to laparoscopy if they cannot find uh, the testis within the inguinal canal. So what does it look like? Here that you'll see there's a hypochoic um, testicular appearance within the inguinal canal surrounded by fat. This one is actually up uh, near the internal inguinal ring. You can see adjacent to loops of bowel. And in this particular image, you can see here are two testes that are uh, along the internal inguinal ring just within the pelvis, here on the right, the bladder, and then here on the left. So in summary, most of the time, this is all we're going to do to really look for undescended testes. So the inguinal canal and around the bladder. Beyond that, ultrasound has a pretty limited role in looking for undescended testes elsewhere within the abdomen. Now moving on to acute scrotal pain, the mantra typically is, is that if after clinical exam and evaluating the patient, a clinician thinks it's torsion, then you should go straight to surgery. You should not bother with any sort of imaging examination. And the reason for this is that rapid diagnosis is vital and that testicular salvage is related to time from onset of symptoms. So if you can get to a patient before, say, 12 hours, there's a very good chance that you'll be able to save the testis. If you get to them after 12 hours, um, often you'll get a, a result like this where you have an infarcted necrotic testis that cannot be salvaged. However, you've got to realize that most pediatric patients with acute testicular pain don't have testicular torsion. In a clinical review, about 30% do, but in imaging reviews, much less than 10% of children will have it. In part, that's a sampling bias because most patients now get imaged and not uh, treated just on the basis of physical exam. So while testicular torsion is a clinical diagnosis, most children won't have it and thus don't need surgery. The exam can be unclear even in those that do have testicular torsion, and it is, of course, a very litigious area. So all that means our clinicians want to make very sure that they're not missing something and that they're not performing unnecessary surgery. So that means that we're going to image these kids. Ultrasound is certainly the gold standard for this. Nobody uses uh, nuclear medicine studies anymore, so ultrasound with Doppler is the standard. Um, you need to do grayscale examination and then some sort of color or power Doppler. My opinion is you also should have a waveform to document a symmetric arterial flow. Now, the grayscale appearance is said to be unreliable, um, and that I think is in general true. However, 
Um, I think most of you that have much experience or that start doing this are going to realize that the grayscale appearance is almost never normal. So these testes often have a transverse lie. You may actually see a twisted spermatic cord. You may be uh, able to identify a bell clapper deformity, and there is often a paracesticular mass or pseudomass. So I think something that's become very clear is that uh, you can usually see a cord twist. So on this image, you can certainly see the normal perfuse testes with power Doppler, the enlarged, relatively hypoechoic testis next to it. Um, and then if you look, I think I can make you believe that this swollen cord looks very twisted, and I can detect flow in the cord right down to the level of the testis itself. In this other case, again, I think you can see and appreciate uh, both on the extended field of view image and this clip um, that the cord is twisted. You can certainly see there is flow actually in this cord, but once we get down to the testis itself, there's very, very poor perfusion. There's been some good work. This is not my clip. This is from uh, Dr. Del Pozo in Madrid and scanning transversely along the uh, inguinal area and down into the scrotum, I think you can sort of get this kind of whirlpool appearance, very much like what we see with a mid-gut volvulus of the testicular vessels swirling uh, in this twisted cord. Um, there's been some good literature suggests that this may be one of the most sensitive ways to diagnose testicular torsion. The reason testes torse is that there's malfixation of the testis within the scrotum. And this is referred to as the bell clapper deformity. If you think of the, of the testis as the clapper and then the scrotum as the bell, the testis is free to, to move about within the scrotal sac and twist upon its vascular pedicle. This can be a very difficult diagnosis to make, but if you do have some hydrocele fluid, you might be able to do it with very light pressure you will be able to see that there is no fixation of this testis at any point along the scrotal wall. Now this does require a very light touch. Uh, in this particular case, the child was having intermittent scrotal pain. Certainly this is a little bit of a funny looking testis. It is enlarged and a little bit hypoechoic perhaps relative to the asymptomatic normal side. Um, but at this point the child was fairly pain free. But with a very light touch and scanning around, you, know, you can tell that this is not a fixed testis. So this child most likely has intermittent torsion and detorsion, which we know occurs in approximately 50% of boys who ultimately present with testicular torsion. So look for that when you have the hydrocele fluid, because even though this child doesn't need surgery tonight, this child needs urologic consultation and orchidopexy. Often with torsion, usually with torsion, you're going to have an abnormal position of the testis. So even though we are scanning superior to inferior in a longitudinal fashion related to the body, um, on the left testis we certainly have a, uh, a transverse view of the testis since it has an or abnormal high transverse lie within the scrotal sac as opposed to the normal longitudinal view of the asymptomatic side. And of course when we turn on color we've got flow in the asymptomatic side, no demonstrable flow in the painful side, and again, that has to be considered torsion. This paratesticular mass or pseudomass is usually composed of swollen cord and enlarged epididymis. Sometimes there can be some hemorrhage, uh, but often you'll get this large paratesticular mass adjacent to uh, the testicle itself, and of course, you still need to put on uh, Doppler, prove that there's no flow, and in this case, we're not able to get any flow in the symptomatic side. And of course, you have to prove you can get flow somewhere so we can see flow in the normal side, again, indicating acute testicular torsion. Just more images again. Uh, I usually always start with the asymptomatic side, one, to gain uh, the confidence and trust of the, uh, the child before moving to the tender side, but also to make sure that I've got sufficient technical parameters to detect flow if it's there. So once I've detected flow in the asymptomatic side, Move to the other side. Little doubt about this one, very heterogeneous necrotic testis. This one with a little more heterogeneous echo texture, but uh, again, I can get flow in paratesticular structures, but no flow within the testis itself. Neonatal torsion is a little bit different. Uh, these are often pre-birth uh, events. Um, these testes are rarely viable, uh, but we do get asked to image them. Um, in this particular case here, this is a fairly acute torsion. This is actually the testis itself, and this is uh, swelling within the uh, walls of the scrotum. 
Um, as these uh, age, you can start getting calcifications in the tunica albuginea here, as you can see in this testis. Um, this is the same one over time. And then when time goes on even further, these may shrink down, and all you may see is just a little calcified nubbin. And this is frequently a finding when we're looking for undescended testes, and if you actually don't find one, if you find this, you can be pretty assured that this is a perinatal torsion, and this is all that's left of uh, the testicular tissue on that side. In late torsion, uh, you get inhomogeneity of the testis. If it becomes necrotic, or if there's areas of hemorrhage, like in this case, once you get to this point, it's pretty clear these are non-salvageable testes. That does have some implications for surgical timing, uh, depending when the child was NPO or availability of operating rooms. Doppler flow will show nothing in the center, and you'll get this intense inflammatory hyperemia in the soft tissues around the testis, um, equivalent to the nuclear medicine uh, donut sign. You always have to look at both sides. Regrettably, sometimes there is bilateral torsion, as in this case, uh, with non-salvageable perinatal uh, torsions. So some of the pitfalls in ultrasound examination include spontaneous detorsion, intermittent torsion, uh, and both of these can have increased flow, or partial or incomplete torsion, in where flow is present, um, but it's going to be uh, decreased. So manual detorsion is a great method for um, restoring flow to the testes as quickly as possible. Um, this is also the appearance you're going to get if you have spontaneous detorsion. So on the left-hand image, you can see an enlarged testis with some reactive hydrocele fluid and some thickening of the scrotal wall, very typical for torsion. Normal flow on the other side. After manual detorsion, you actually get reactive hyperemia into the previously ischemic tissues some fairly high diastolic flow, and this is the same kind of thing that you're going to see with spontaneous detorsion, and I'll get to that in a minute. So this is a cautionary tale of uh, what can happen with intermittent torsion. So this image on the left, it's an older case, was of a young man who came to uh, my previous institution with uh, scrotal pain over the course of approximately 14 months, and every time he had an image that looked like this. Testis was a little big, epididymis was a little big, and he was called epididymitis and treated and sent away. Now, he was actually followed appropriately by urology, but um, never had any laboratory indicators of epididymitis, and importantly, always felt better by the time he got his imaging done. So the image here is the same left testis, this time after about seven days of experiencing pain again, and he didn't bother to come in because it was always the same. He got an ultrasound, he got antibiotics, he went home. This time, however, when he came in, this is clearly a dead testis. And in one of the clinic notes, um, again, it said that every time he'd been imaged before, his pain had resolved. And that's a good indicator that you're dealing with intermittent torsion. So this time he didn't bother to come in. Unfortunately, he did not detorse this particular time, and he had a non-salvageable testis. Partial or incomplete torsion is generally defined as less than a 360-degree twist. And importantly, the color flow may be present, but it's going to be less than the asymptomatic side. And while waveforms may be abnormal, you may have higher resistance, you may have variants in venous outflow, um, I've also seen enough cases with normal waveforms that I don't think you can count on that. So in this particular case, certainly not a normal ultrasound appearance. There's an abnormal lie of the testis in this longitudinal view of the scrotum. There is a paratesticular mass. And when you turn on color, Asymptomatic side has a lot more color than the symptomatic side. I will tell you these waveforms looked exactly the same. But if you are relying on a sonographer or are you, you have in your mind that this is a binary decision of flow versus no flow, you are going to miss these cases. And they're not common, but they're not rare either. So you have to pay attention to sort of the semi-quantitative amount of flow between the symptomatic and asymptomatic side. If the flow is less, or even equal, you have to be worried about torsion in a painful testis. The most common thing in the prepubertal male to cause uh, acute scrotal pain is torsion of a testicular appendage, and there's several of them. The dominant players are the appendix epididymis, present in roughly a quarter of boys, and the appendix testis, which is present in approximately 95% of boys. And in the normal state, these are a little bit difficult to see. They tend not to be too large. Um, you can see them 
Here you can see the testis uh, or the appendage epididymis and testis right next to one another, which is why clinically you really can't tell them apart. And when you've got a little bit of fluid, you can see these little tiny things uh, floating in uh, hydrocele fluid. So when they torse um, and infarct, they become very, very focally painful. And if you're a very good examiner, you can determine that there's focal pain rather than diffuse pain as in testicular torsion. But that's non-trivial for uh, even a fairly experienced examiner. You may be able to feel a nodule or see a faint bluish discoloration if you pull the scrotal skin over the uh, appendiceal torsion and you'll see this sort of blue dot sign. I think you can faintly see in that picture. By ultrasound, if you look for them, you can almost always find them. Um, there's usually a hydrocele fluid and sort of non-specific inflammatory response. There's a lot of hyperemia. And a lot of these kids end up being called epididymitis. Um, and while that's true, it is inflammation of the epididymis and surrounding structures. It's not the typical epididymitis that we think about in postpubertal and adult patients. So in this particular case, you can see this enlarged uh, um, uh, torsed appendage right here. They are typically larger than five millimeters. They often have what's been referred to as a salt and pepper appearance. Um, and then you can see the tremendous inflammatory response around it with color Doppler and absence of flow within the torus appendage itself. Sometimes you can also get increased flow within the uh, testis, uh, but typically it's really just the uh, epididymis and periappendiceal tissues. Here's another case, again, with that sort of heterogeneous appearance, creating lots of increased flow in the surrounding tissues and the, uh, and the testis itself. And a companion case, this child went to the OR, uh, not because uh, of failure to make the diagnosis, but because of unremitting pain despite conservative therapy over seven days. And so you can see clearly the little infarcted uh, testis right here and the tremendous inflammatory response within the epididymis and on the surface of the, uh, of the testis itself. So here's a case that uh, I missed. I thought this was going to be a uh, detorsion event uh, of the testis. There was tremendous... Uh, uh, hyperemia and inflammatory changes, um, and I lost a bet to my urologist. Uh, this child also went to the operating room just because his pain was not going away as expected, and probably what this was was uh, a little torsed appendage right here. And when I talked to my urologist afterwards, I asked him, well, how did you know? And the reason was is that he said the child still hurt. If this was a detorsion, the child would not have the same kind of pain as what brought him into the hospital. This child was having pain you know, right up until induction of anesthesia. So that is not the clinical symptom for uh, a detorsion event. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Eventually, these torsed appendages will shrink down in size. They'll become a little calcified nubbin. They may even become little uh, scrotal lifts moving freely within the scrotal sac like this one. Um, and so, again, when you see these little scrotal lifts or scrotal mice, uh, at least in my age population that I see, often these are due to torus appendages. Now epididymitis does still occur. Uh, typically it's in an adolescent and again with the, uh, the same risk factors as in, uh, as in young adults, so urinary tract infections and sexually transmitted diseases. In the younger child you do have to think about structural abnormalities dis and dysfunctional voiding, but again those are pretty uncommon relative to appendiceal torsion causing at least a similar ultrasound appearance of appendiceal, I'm sorry, uh, epididymal uh, inflammatory changes. Imaging for epididymitis, again, nonspecific thickening of the scrotal skin, some reactive hydrocele fluid, and enlarged, sometimes heterogeneous epididymis um, with increased color flow. Occasionally, you can actually get inflammatory changes and adjacent infarction in the testis, as in this case. And in some 10 to 20 percent or so of cases, you may get a generalized epididymal or chitis if inflammatory changes spread to the scrotum itself or the testicle itself. Idiopathic scrotal edema is something uh, that is fairly unique to the prepubertal uh, age range, generally four to seven years. These children present with pain, edema, and erythema. They generally have a spontaneous resolution. Um, at ultrasound, they will have normal testes, but you will see scrotal edema and hyperemia, as in this slightly older case. You can see lots of edema with these little septations running through it, and these are vascular channels in the fibrous stroma. 
Children can also have their scrotum involved by vasculitis. In adults, we usually think of polyarteritis nodosa, but in kids, it's usually henoch schoenlein purpura. Here's Professor Henlock and here's Professor Schoenlein. This is a small vessel vasculitis that can involve multiple organ systems, but the scrotum is involved in up to 40%. And what you may see on the scrotum are the typical purpuric skin changes. Uh, the testes are usually always normal, but the epididymi will be swollen and hyperemic. There's often a hydrocele and some very severe scrotal wall thickening due to the skin small vessel vasculitis. So again, here's a child with tremendous thickening of the scrotal skin, even some little bit of fluid, completely normal testes, but tremendous inflammatory changes within the epididymis. And this is a pretty typical pattern. So in terms of the typical things that we see, you know, a very sort of easy algorithm is that when you have a child with acute scrotal pain, if there is no flow or reduced flow, that child needs surgery because you have to presume torsion. And looking at those cases of uh, incomplete or partial torsion, the diagnosis is no longer binary. You can't just say flow, no flow. You have to compare amounts of flow side to side. If there's hyperemia and pain, pain the same degree as what brought them into the hospital, that child doesn't need surgery because those are always going to be inflammatory uh, conditions or infectious conditions, things that need medical treatment, not surgical treatment. Now, if you have hyperemia and reduced pain, you really have to consider detorsion. Okay, that's a fairly classic pattern. So you don't want to miss those kids who detorse and then come back later like the case I showed with a dead testicle. And just if this is a little bit easier, this is just from a, a paper uh, that I wrote a few years ago, just in graphical form, the same thing that I said. Again, suspicious torsion, scrotal pain, reduced flow, go to surgery. We do see kids for trauma, especially in athletic events, uh, and so there's a variety of uh, manifestations you'll see. Most simple is just a hematocele. The appearance of the hematocele is going to depend upon the acuity of the injury. Uh, in this case, here's the testis, and there's this large um, kind of echogenic complex fluid around it. As it ages, like blood elsewhere in the body, you'll get uh, some breakdown and separation of blood products into blood fluid levels, as well as septations internally. If there's been more damage to the testicle itself, you may see heterogeneous uh, parenchyma, in this case of an intratesticular hematoma. And really our goal here is to make sure that it's still perfused and to see if the tunica is intact. And while it's non-trivial to look for this, ultrasound is actually pretty good at trying to diagnose uh, uh, testicular rupture. Um, there's been some very good papers, especially from the San Francisco group. And in this case, you're looking for disruptions in the white line of the tunica albuginea and complex extrusion of um, uh, tubular structures out into the uh, uh, peritesticular tissues. This is important because these patients need to be repaired uh, both to try to salvage the testis as well as to prevent infertility due to the formation of anti-sperm antibodies. Here's another case, uh, testicular fracture. There was interruption of the tunica and this child had to go to surgery for a non-survivable testis. So the last big category is a scrotal mass. So clearly it's, uh, it's alarming when anyone finds a scrotal mass in examination. The good news is that ultrasound has an extremely high sensitivity uh, for diagnosing these. So it can tell you whether it's present or absent, whether it's an intratesticular or an extratesticular lesion. Um, and also fortunately in children, it's much less common than adults. Testicular tumors account for only 1% of childhood cancer, and there are peaks in the very young child less than five years and in the immediate post-pubertal period. So unlike in adults, uh, seminomas are very, very uncommon in children. Most are of germ cell origin, either teratomas, both benign and malignant, or endodermal sinus or yolk sac tumors. And then approximately 10% are strotal, stromal tumors, either Leydig cell or Sertoli cell. So with imaging, certainly we'll be able to determine if a mass exists, but for most lesions, ultrasound is not histologically specific. Um, Doppler as well is more size dependent than histology dependent with uh, larger tumors tending to be more vascular. Uh, there is some uh, suggestion that you can help differentiate uh, enlargement from tumor from inflammation, but that's uh, not terribly reliable. And while there's been a lot written on MRI in adult patients, the role 
in pediatric patients is unclear, again, uh, because seminomas are not very common, and that's, uh, that's the role of advanced imaging for most adult disease. So just some images of testicular tumors. Again, just a large mass, yolk sac carcinoma. This more heterogeneous mass ended up being a mixed embryonal and choriocarcinoma. Here's another yolk sac tumor, nothing particularly distinctive about its appearance. This is actually the tumor with a compressed rim of testis around it. And you can see on this fairly large lesion that it's very uh, hyperemic with uh, color Doppler. Testicular teratomas are one of those lesions that you can start to uh, consider as a diagnosis. You can uh, often see mixed solid and cystic tumors. Sometimes you can see the calcifications within it. Um, these are always benign in prepubertal patients, but when you have a patient in puberty, there's a much higher incidence of having some mixed uh, malignant elements. Testicular epidermoids have a fairly character, characteristic appearance of this sort of laminated or onion skinned world appearance. They can be multiple as in this case. Again, these are one of the few lesions you can suggest a specific histologic diagnosis with ultrasound. Leydig cell tumor, this is a small one that was very hyperemic. Um, and again, nothing specific about its appearance. There is a specific, uh, specific tumor, um, a calcifying Sertoli cell, which is unique to uh, pediatric patients. As you can see here, this large rock-like mass within the uh, superior part of the testis. One thing I think when you're scanning kids, uh, especially prepubertal kids, is you have to consider um, trying to make a diagnosis when you can because you can offer these children testis sparing surgery. So ultrasound is nearly 100% accurate in determining whether a mass is present. And like I said, the histologic specificity is generally poor. However, some lesions do have some pretty characteristic appearances. Cysts, epidermoids, and teratomas. And like I said, prepubertal teratomas have always been benign. There has never been a reported case of a malignancy in a prepubertal teratoma. So when you have a case like this, it's fairly typical. Um, there's a thin rim of parenchyma here, and this is a large cystic mass with sort of little dermoid plugs. So when you suggest that diagnosis, the surgeon can offer um, testis sparing surgery. And courtesy of my friend, Dr. Rama Jayanti, here is a particular case that he did. You have to treat these like a cancer operation. So this is done through the inguinal canal with delivery of uh, scrotal contents and surgical control. In this case, he's sliced open the thin rim of testicular tissue, and he was able to shell out in its entirety this cystic mass. And you can actually see the little soft tissue wall, or the soft tissue nodule here through the wall. And he sews up the testicle. Now, you might be thinking, is this really worth doing? But I'll tell you, one year later, here is that testis. And there's a little post-surgical calcification but this testis is normal in size and is symmetric to its counterpart. So this is definitely worth doing if you can preoperatively make the suggestion that this is a benign diagnosis and that your surgeon is willing to take the extra time to try to perform testis sparing surgery. Secondary tumors are not very common in kids. Uh, most all of them are leukemia and lymphoma, uh, lesser uh, frequency of neuroblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma. Testicular leukemia can present as either uh, an enlarged testis, uh, diffusely enlarged and sort of mixed heterogeneity, uh, echogenicity, or you can have little focal areas typically of hypoechogenicity. And these testes are almost always very, very hyperemic. Um, and Dr. Siegel has described uh, these abnormal vessels. Normally when you do Doppler studies, the vessels are very straight and regular and linear. And here you can see they don't really have a very organized pattern, probably from leukemic infiltration. And that's a fairly characteristic sign. Very similar appearance with testicular lymphoma. Again, in large testes, they tend to be hypoechoic, can be focal or diffuse. And Doppler can help you if you're unclear whether a little area of heterogeneity is abnormal or not. Um, certainly the more diffusely involved testis, uh, there's tremendous hyperemia. In this one, there was a question of uh, heterogeneity in the inferior pole. And when you turn on color, certainly there's something very abnormal going on, and that was biopsy proven to be lymphoma as well. Paratesticular tumors are usually malignant in kids. The most common is uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, although occasionally you can get neuroblastoma and lymphoma leukemia uh, lesions as well. 
So non-malignant masses, the most common one are hydrocele's. Uh, in an infant, you have to be concerned about patent processes vaginalis and accompanying hernias. In the older child, you may see uh, a new hydrocele with inflammation or trauma, testicular torsion, or even with tumor. And there's three main types, the scrotal or common garden variety uh, hydrocele, an insisted hydrocele of the cord, and then an abdominal scrotal hydrocele. So garden variety hydrocele, the patent process is vaginalis. You've all seen that. Fluid comes and surrounds the testis. Again, there's normal fixation of the testis against uh, the scrotal wall. The insisted hydrocele, or funiculocele, some people call them, is really a loculated fluid within the inguinal canal. Testis is below, abdominal cavity is up above. Um, these can often be mistaken for incarcerated hernias or even lipomas. Lipomas are very uncommon in pediatric population, whereas uh, an insisted hydrocele is actually fairly common. And then lastly is uh, the abdominal scrotal hydrocele, where you have this large fluid collection filling the scrotum, extending up often as an abdominal mass in uh, one of the lower quadrants. And here you can see the, the lone testicle you know, emits this uh, sea of fluid. These require a different surgical approach, as you might imagine, for complete excision. Hernias are very common, and they may contain bowel or omentum uh, within the uh, inguinal canal or even extending down into the scrotum. It's important that you have to have some sort of pressure in the abdomen, either with valsalva or if it's a young child that can't cooperate. Um, I've even scanned these children standing to try to increase abdominal pressure to uh, make a hernia appear. Uh, if you see hyperemia of the bowel, you need to think about incarceration. If there's bowel but has no peristalsis, um, you need to think about ischemia. Uh, omental hernias can be a little trickier. They look like a complex mass, often very echogenic because of the fat, but typically you can follow vessels down and make this diagnosis. So this particular patient uh, had an incarcerated uh, hernia, probably with early strangulation. We could follow bowel loops through the inguinal canal down into the uh, scrotum. And here you can see there's good blood flow up until the point of this fairly tight, narrow um, uh, hernia ring, and then uh, no flow in the bowel beyond. You know, the importance, uh, again, of uh, some sort of provocative maneuver. In this case, we have a normal testis, hydrocele, and some unclear mass with valsalva. This large fatty mass increases greatly in size. Another way of looking within the uh, um, inguinal canal here, you wouldn't say there is anything going on, but with Valsalva, you get this protrusion of abdominal contents, again, in this case, um, uh, omental fat. And again, just in this short video clip, you can see if you took the image at this point, you would see nothing, but with Valsalva, you get protrusion of abdominal contents uh, down superior to the testis. So in that quick review, in summary, um, you have to remember with acute scrotal pain that the color Doppler diagnosis is not binary. Um, partial torsion and detorsion uh, certainly exist. You have to correlate it with the status of pain. If the patient still hurts as much as what uh, caused them to come to the hospital um, and they have hyperemia, you have to consider inflammatory infectious conditions. If they have that hyperemic appearance but their pain is better, you really have to think about detorsion, and that child still needs surgical consultation. Torsed appendage is the most common cause of acute scrotal pain before puberty, and it can look very much like epididymitis if you don't take the extra care to look around and actually find the torsed appendage. For scrotal masses, ultrasound is highly sensitive, but not terribly specific. Um, germ cell tumors are the most common, and when you do see those few specific uh, cases that you can provide some specificity, like testicular cysts, like prepubertal teratomas, like epidermoid cysts. Um, you can just suggest to your surgeons that testis sparing surgery is a good option. And again, we start with undescended testis, and honestly, after a good physical exam, there's probably little role for imaging. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been useful for you.